Now you're telling me, Ooh. Comedy Store, that you don't want that on your stages at 1 a.m. on a Saturday? Come on, guys. Oh. It's good to have you back on, John. It's great John? to be back. Scoot doo. Blabbity blue. Scoot dee. Oh, yeah. I like that you wear your own merch on, on air. I only wear my own merch, and the and I don't your, even leave. Your levels so it's not are public. high. You got you got hot. Your your levels are high, my friend. But then again, you you project because you're an actor. <clears throat> my brother in law is very excited for this episode. Hello. Right, that's perfect. Oh, I love it. You look like Joakim Noah. <laughs> In a good way. I should take that thing off. I kind of like it. I love it. There's something like Joakim Noah about it. In a, not in a good way. He though. was Defensive Player of the Year one of those times. No, no he wasn't. <laughs> yes, he was. That was me being a defensive player. Oh, I didn't even connect those dots, and that's why... You're the, the host. Each other sentences. Welcome back to another episode of I'm the Host. Today, <laughs> I'm the host. John, if you could be quiet, I'm going to do like a 30-minute intro. Yeah, great. So I wear my own merch because I I mean, I, I only want to wear the most comfortable clothing. So if you want to pick up a Scoot Doo t-shirt or I'm not passing the Comedy Store hoodie, head on over to rickglassman.com and click on the store button at the top. And don't be a fool. Use promo code BOOBS for 10% off. No. We'll be right back. Hello, goblins and TYSO fans. Please buy merch for my son. The t-shirts are soft and beautiful, and the new hoodie is very warm and comfortable. <laughs> Please buy merch from us. We need the money. <laughs> now, what happens if you do get passed at the Comedy Store in 2021? Uh... I scratch off the uh, not no I scratch off the comedy store because that's how much it matters <laughs> yeah <clears throat> dude yeah. hello I I, 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 I let me hear you talk <clears throat> you should be passed at the comedy store and every time I see that hoodie A I want one because I'm also not passed correctly so B I don't want to have to pay for it and see, it makes me mad that you're not passed. You want one because you don't want to have to pay for it? I, no, that was B. I want one. These right. are my well, thoughts. What, B doesn't matter? I want one. I don't want to pay for it. And you should be passed at the comedy store because you're a once-in-a-generation talent. And I'm not just saying that because you're my guy. Why are you saying it then? Because, because it's true, John, man. I'm not that funny. <laughs> yes, you are, dude. And I know you're, <laughs> you're, you're goating me, dude. You're goating me. But there's so many comics at the comedy store who are very talented, but they're all very similar. Angry, white, entitled boomers or Gen Xers who say it's awkward to talk to girls and I can't Shh, believe... What do you mean? Give me an example of a joke. Oh my God, you know, I was just with my girl the other day and I must have said the wrong thing because <laughs> yeah. this bitch got mad at me. And it's like, fuck man, I'm just trying to get my dick sucked. And it's like, yeah, there's 20 of those guys, but there's only one Ricky oh, G. But that works. Yeah, for those 20 guys. So do one, two, three, four, throw in a Ricky G, and then do five, six, seven, eight, nine. Well, what would a Ricky G be? Uh, you know, blah, 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 and then like boobs and like deconstructing and commentating on it and doing genre parody like Wet Hot American Summer stuff. Performance art, juggling, keeping balls in the air. Balls people forgot are up there. And then you remember and they come back. Callbacks, connections, connect the dots, create your own sentences, anagrams, dude. You could do all that stuff. Let's get serious for a minute. Sure. You guys are having a hard time because you couldn't visit family for the yes. holidays because of COVID. Yes, let's get serious real quick. Yeah. That sounds tough. Yes. <laughs> we'll be right back. With more than 50 years as a family-owned business, we've got you covered. Yeah, look, it's really hard about the Christmas stuff, and I'm, I want to get real, but I want to finish my thought real quick about the comedy store because I'm not past the comedy store, correctly so, but you are miles above me, dude, and you are, it's not just that you're one of a kind, it's that you're there. In 2012, when we were answering phones, we weren't ready yet. We were up and comers. It's not we just were, that you're one of a kind, but you're there? You're at the place. You're, you're at the place of being able to do 15 minutes in West Hollywood sometimes. <laughs> 
And like, you've got the material, you've learned how to repeat bits, you've learned how to be present in bits. It's other sentences. It's sentences. And the, the comedy store used to be known for displaying unique, powerful talent. And that was their thing. People were like, whoa, this guy at the comedy store, I've never seen anything like that before. Andy Kaufman, whoever else, we got to go next Saturday with my friends. It's going to be so much fun. Cut to 2020. We don't do that anymore. Now we've got a once in a generational Jewish American talent who can do genre parody, who can do callbacks, who can do deconstruct the other art. Other sentences. Says his. And we're not going to pass. Oh, guess what? He started here. He started being a, answering the phones and being a door guy. He started working the system of the open mics. He's been a series regular on Undateable. He's been a series regular on upcoming soon Amazon Prime's original On the Spectrum written by Emmy winner Jeffrey Kadams. He's the lead character. Jason, Jason, Jason Kadams. He's the lead character. He's been in Netflix's David Wayne movie about National Lampoon. He played Harold Ramis. And he's also been in that canceled FX show, The Comedians, with Billy Crystal and Josh Gad, where he played a stoner dude. But all of that, now he's not our guy, even though he started here. And that's where my issue is. We get the white Gen Xer who's mad and feels entitled to the world and doesn't like that he has to wear a mask and wants to still tour and go to Austin or whatever. But what about the millennial who's smart and has got it and is magic, baby? You're benching LeBron. LeBron's going to go to the improv. And the improv is going to start making cake. Every time you go like this, it's going to put you into a new, uh, take your shoes off. I mean, uh, not past hat, not past socks, not past shoes. <laughs> uh. Yeah, anyway, man, it makes sense that I'm not past. I mean, I'm just a fucking loser writer You're of not a like loser failed writer. shows. What failed shows? Every show on day, oh. Uh, yeah, uh, living bit. Uh, the cool kids. Well, well, you know what? <laughs> on one hand, it's like, oh, all those shows got canceled. Yeah. But on the other hand. Writer's assistant, <laughs> staff writer, co-producer, yeah, producer. And yeah. Next step is uh, actually back. supervising producer currently. Well, next step. I'm saying producer. Next step. No, I've already passed that step. I don't want to be that guy, but I've already. Wait a minute. You're telling me. Yeah. Go ahead. That canceled shows, yeah. network television, nobody yeah. cares. Yeah. But wait a minute. You're you're past a producer. Correct. You're just a young guy. Well. I look younger than I am, but yes. <laughs> How old are you? You can't be more than 12. <laughs> <laughs> what are you? What are you? Are you telling me you're, you're 13? No, I'm 35. Kevin! <laughs> A lot of people do that. I've noticed. I've seen multiple people grab their, <clears throat> grab their cheeks and yeah. say, Kevin. Yeah. That's crazy to me. Because of Home Alone 1 and 2. Kevin doesn't grab his cheeks and say his own name. Oh, of course not. The mom does it. Wait, who's saying that they are Kevin? I've seen people impersonate Home Alone by going like this. Kevin! He slaps his cheeks and yells. She says Kevin and she faints. She sits up and says Kevin, yeah. And then the second one faints. Now, there's this rumor. Uh, eh, maybe I shouldn't. I don't want to. No, no, no. It's, this is your podcast. Yeah, but then, but you we regurgitate this information and then people might misconstrue it and take it as a fact. And, I don't and know that's how is, fake news starts, correct? I don't know if I should do it. Well, we can always edit it out. All right, you know what? Actually, turn the... Yeah, all right, this is... Oh, phew, I love being off camera. <laughs> so much better. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my balls. <laughs> yeah, I've been sitting on those for hours. <laughs> People say that Macaulay Culkin, mm -hmm. may he rest in peace, when he's sleeping, right. says uh, uh, improvised grabbing his cheeks and yelling. Who says that? Everybody. <laughs> Name seven. <laughs> uh, Instagram, cinematography, films, and Yeah. Uh, did you know who improvised what.com? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> those are the big two. And then That's the, the stuff you want at the comedy store, by the way. If I say name seven, I want a guy who's able to fucking start throwing shit, baby. That's good. Thanks, man. But there's no way eight-year-old Macaulay Culkin improvised the scream. So uh, apparently he... Ask me how I know. Because you... and Oh, sorry. I don't want to answer for you. How do you know? The script I've read. Yeah. It says ah in it. Two, the direction is geared up for that moment. They cut into it tight knowing what's about what to happen. What I think people are misconstruing is it may have been his idea to keep his hands on his cheeks while he's yelling. Yes. But the yell was in the script. I, I read I it. I read it. It says, ah. Okay. Good. By the way, on the way in here, your neighbor in, this new, in the new castle, the new Rick castle, has a, has a big ass. I, uh, that's pretty cool. I, I had a few requirements moving into the new place. Yeah. Uh, balcony for obvious reasons. Because of COVID. Yes. 
uh, girls with, with fat asses. Mm. Or, you know what? I've been getting some comments that say, oh, we got to stop calling women girls, first of all. Ugh. <laughs> you know? Are we supposed to call me us men instead of guys or boys? No. I'll call you... I don't want to go down that... <laughs> no, what do you want to call them? I want to call them women if I'm talking about, like, you know... When I look at a woman oh. or women, oh. I, I see strength. I yes. see pride. I see a badass mother who don't take no crap from nobody. An ability to juggle, baby. Now, but sometimes when I'm talking about the, the girls in, the, in, in my courtyard who've got <laughs> fat asses, if I say the women have fat asses, it sounds like I'm saying these women need to get in shape. A woman <laughs> with a fat ass sounds like my mom complaining about her body. A these girl with a fat need... ass sounds like me on a Tuesday. Can that be a t-shirt? These women need to get in shape? That's funny. <laughs> well... Contextually, anyway, I said, I said, hey, that's a nice tukus on you, and I'm doing Rick's thing, so she might come over later. Did you really say that to her? Yes. <laughs> Hello? Oh, come on in. Oh, hey, baby. <laughs> come on, come on. Oh, oh, oh. Whoa, I'm in a relate. Rick, don't. Oh. You're in a relationship. Oh. Oh, 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 I'm so embarrassed, but I, I feel like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Rick, you're long distance. You're long distance. Just say no. Oh, no. I wish I could help. Oh, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> shoot. <laughs> oh, yeah, baby. Yeah. Now you're telling me, Ooh. Comedy Store, that you don't want that on your stages at 1 a.m. on a Saturday? Come on, guys. Oh. Good to have you back on, John. It's great John? to be back. If you're looking for just the right flooring, you need choices. John, <laughs> you, uh, and I'm speaking to the audience through you right now, you were the first Take Your Shoes Off guest. Yeah, pilot. You, uh, you were also the last guest of 2019. Yeah. So I thought it fitting to have you be the first guest of 2021. Ugh. It's nice to come on, and I know that I'm probably going to get lower numbers than usual because I'm not... An actor. I don't have a you're huge a social me media following. But Who your gives? social media is great. But that's the thing is that nobody cares, dude. People want the shiny object. They don't want the thing that makes a shiny object. And I'm okay with that. So I'm tell me more about that. You make the shiny object. You make the thing that people go, ah. Yeah. But it's almost like. But it's a team. It's a team. It's right. a team. It's a team. It's a team. Mm -hmm. It's a team. We both make it. If it's on the script and it's great, awesome. But if you don't. Bring the glass. Elevate it. Yeah, if you don't elevate, we both have to elevate. Now, John, I've used this metaphor before with yeah. you on the phone two nights ago. But I, I look at television like I look at a restaurant. Now, everybody has their job, and some people do multiple roles. But the hostess, yeah. or the host, but it's, <laughs> come on. Come on. Imagine. Welcome to, you know, Steakhouse. I'm a guy. No, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll go oh, over to the other uh, Steakhouse. Uh, look, there, there's a 10-minute wait. I'm a guy watching the big game drinking a beer. Uh, we'll, we'll go somewhere else. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you walk in and, and it's like, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. There's a wait. But do you mind sitting over there? Or if you go to the bar. Do and they like, does drinks. she play with her hair? Like, oh, there's a wait. Yeah. But like, if you sit down, I'll come and get you myself. Oops. Like that. And she drops her pen <laughs> yeah. and then she picks it up. But when she bends down and to pick it up. it's a stick figure. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, man. You know when, and, and this is, you know what? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn off uh, the liberal snowflakes right now, but I'm going to turn on the guys. When a girl, not a woman, uh -huh. when a, I'll tell you what, when either, if they're just plat, 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 plow. Uh -huh. Right, right. Hourglass, 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 sands of time, sands of time, sands of time. Speaking of hourglass and sands of time, you ever tried to have a conversation with one of these? When they bend over, and Dude. now this is this is this Dude, is. You just said you said the misogynistic thing. You took a sip take, then you go when they bend over, <laughs> like to start. A but, but I want I want to make sure that I'm clear. This is 2003, give or take a couple years at most, mm -hmm. but like 2003. Okay. When they bend over, yes, and their underwear, <laughs> or as I like to call it, their schlong thong. <laughs> yeah. When you rhyme, it yeah. just yeah. 
That's why the whale tail took off so much in 03. Right. It wouldn't take off. It was called the dolphin tail. <laughs> yes. Right? Which makes more sense because dolphins are smart like women. Like women. And they're powerful like women. Yes. And, and they're, they're able to work as a team like women. Yes. And they don't eat all day like whales. Yes. <laughs> they also belong <laughs> in the ocean like women, but not girls. When they bend over and you yeah. see their schlong thong. <laughs> yes. And, and, then it like, and then their pants comes down a little bit. And then you see the, what's a whale tail? Whale tail is the, it was, yeah, it, synonyms. Is a schlong thong. Synonyms, yeah. Right. I actually meant whale tail. I've never heard of a thong schlong. A thong schlong well, would probably be what a guy wears. Yeah, they don't have schlongs, presumably. And that's the problem. Unless they want to, then that's fine as well. Depending on what year we're in. Yeah. But we're in 2003. Right. So then, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. what are you? What we'll are go you? to a restaurant uh, next yeah. door if there's a way. Yeah, we'll go to Baskin Robbins or whatever. Yeah. But I'm just picturing like when girls used to bend over and they had their thongs and it was just like really like scandalous. And then you were like, oh, dang. I always thought it was white trash. Yes. And, I, and, and, and now and I'm being serious. And you know, I'm being serious now because I said I'm being serious. Yeah. I think that people would get mad at the term white trash. Really? I think so. I think white trash is up there with like, you can't say that. And I don't think it's because of the word white. Mm. I think it's because the, the white trash. trash. <laughs> I think it's white trash people. Yeah. Like, they're like, <laughs> there's, there's two types of white trash. Yeah. Right? I there, thought there's going to be two types of whites. But you're saying there's two types of white trash. Well, there's two types of people in general. Right. You have white people and you have black people. Yeah, those are the two. And if you want to hear more about that, you have to check out my stand-up. At the improv, not the comedy store, unless somebody makes amends, you were saying? Or a woman's, which would be better. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those conversations where it's just it's moving too fast to trim it. Yeah. So it's just we're going to have to have it all. But hey, you know, it's part of the ride. You know what? But white tra there's white trash people that are like, like uh, Marshall Mathers in, not Marshall Mathers, Bunny Rabbit in 8 Mile. Yeah. Who's like, I'm a piece of white trash and I sing it proudly. Right. 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 Fuck a Papa Doc. Fuck all y'all who doubt me. But then there's people that's like, we're not white trash. But they are. But, they, but I mean, you, you, they're white trash. That's like me saying, I'm not a Martian. Well, no, you're not a Martian. But if I were to be like, I'm not an earthling. Well, you are. Yeah. But you don't want to be branded as right. this thing. Yes. Now, when I say white trash... I, I mean it literally. There's, there's a white trash. There's white trash out yes. there. Yes. Right? Yes. I have a lot of thoughts on this. Oh, right, because you grew up with an alcoholic mother. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> oh, was that's, a... that's the good... That's the non... My, on my dad's side, there is some... What people would say, white trash. And it's funny that you said that it's a bad word because on Allison's side of the family in Wisconsin, they call it WT. Like, they synonym it or abbreviate it so that the kids don't hear, which mean, which tells me that they also think that it's a, a bad word. So they say, oh, there's some WT down the street or whatever. But it means white trash. But yeah, I've been around the mobile home park. I've been also around the yacht club. I've been raised by both kinds of whites. I've got both in me. Wow. Am I afraid of one and angry and trying to suppress it with my designer labels? And these are Dolce's, so... Yeah. That, that means chocolate caramel, correct? Dolce and Gabbana. Oh, chocolate caramel in a cabin. <laughs> yes, yes. But there's always been white trash, and it's a huge problem for us <laughs> because on Twitter or on social media, all of the very cool, diverse people who I love have been blasting on whites because of the work of the white trash. But it's like I can't really jump in. You know what I mean? It's kind of like yeah, well, first got to let it happen, baby. Let the wave pass. I uh, – I yeah, sometimes when I see people, and I, uh, I'm all for the, you know, you know, you know, oh, we gotta stop doing that. But also, like, <laughs> when people are bashing whites, and I understand why they're doing it, yeah. and I under, especially when most of the people that I see doing it are comedians, and it's just their media of a form of making a joke. Yes. But a lot of times, I, I, I can't lie, even though I understand it, when people are like, oh, white men are blah 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 blah, I do feel like, relax. Yeah, because the white men in my life, or should I say the white boys, <laughs> rock the house. But like, I know white people suck, but people suck. That's but, interesting. That's an interesting point. Yeah. So I never yeah. write back oh, uh, because I don't feel defensive about it. You don't feel like some of us are OK because, be, because I believe that is assumed. Okay. I, I don't think that when people say white people, you need a blah, 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 because, yeah, they, they do. Yeah. But, but like that would be like if somebody said, "Hey, comedians, you need to come up with more original material." I'm yeah, a comedian. Yeah. I have original material. I don't feel like I need to be like, "Wait a minute, I have original material." Yeah. But at the same time, 
if people are, are, are saying comedians suck because they don't have original material, I'm thinking, well, comedians don't suck. Yeah. I know that comedians need original material, but I know what they mean. Yeah. But I'm just as a human. That's a great way of looking I, at it. Well, how's, what, which, which part are you connecting with? Like you're like, yeah, we should all have original material. We should all be better. That's not like an in, it's not like a personal insult on me. It's just like, yeah, I would love to have new material. It'd be great. But sometimes it goes so hard. Yes. At at white people, or I like this analogy of comedians because it's it's uh, it's less personal to most people listening to it. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, comedians suck. All they do is blah 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 blah. And it's like, yeah, comedians suck. Yeah. There are thirty funny comedians in the country, and like four thousand people trying. But to like do comedy, yeah. As a comedian. There is part of me that be's like, but you know, I am a comedian and my friends are comedians and we don't, but you yeah. know, that's, so it's, it's, it's there. Everybody has opinions about ev every subset. Like there's a lot of hate about Hollywood in general uh, on the internet during, at least during the election. Like, you know, Hollywood is telling us what to do. Hollywood's telling us what to think. The one thing this pandemic has proven is that we don't need Hollywood. We just need frontline workers. And it's like. Meanwhile, yeah. what are you doing to pass yeah, the time? Yeah, what are you doing? Like, your kids watch the Disney Channel. You know, you read books. You listen to music and albums. You watch movies. You watch TV shows. And it's like, Hollywood is, is and I'm sorry to get serious, Hollywood is one of the most American industries in the world. It started from nothing. It was created in America by Americans, and it influences the whole world. Hollywood is a massive American success. And just because you don't like some, like, progressive policy, you have to say that our entire way of life and our entire industry is garbage. Like, to me... I erroneously got a little personal with some of those election time comments. And I was like, what the, what the fuck? Are, what are they watching right now? They're watching Netflix right now. And yeah. it's just like, but you're right. I have to be like, these people are just mad. They're just sending out hate. Be because, into the yeah, because like when they see, you know, we, uh, as non-Trump non voters that we are, we right. see people that l vote for Trump as white trash. And they <laughs> see us as liberal snowflake bitches. Losers, yeah. And idiots. So they need, we, all, uh, humans, mm -hmm. are search for things to validate their points of view. Yeah. So when, if I right. hate what Sia is telling me to love, I'm going to be like, fuck Sia. But I'm not, I mean, I. Cut to Sia being like, you have to love Cheerio. <laughs> like, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> but like, if Sia was like, listen, all my Hollywood snowflake bitch Cheerios, okay, want to be like Biden rules. But I got to be honest, Trump helps me like get my, you know, my, my twat. Hot. I don't know. I don't know. You know, then they'd be like, yeah, she's. You know, we are. Oh, once they flip, then you love them. Yeah, so yeah. I don't like think when Kanye flipped or when Lil Wayne endorsed Trump. Everyone's like, "Yeah, Lil Wayne's the best," but it's like I thought you hated all of Hollywood. Hollywood people are <clears throat> generally liberal, mm -hmm. so they hate liberals, and Hollywood is a great way to attack. It's it's similar yeah. to the comedian thing. I hate Hollywood. Well, no, you love the. Mo I'll, yeah. I'll give you a perfect, literal and hypothetical analogy. Mm -hmm. No, here's what it is. It's both an analogy and a metaphor. Fifty fifty. This wow. is perfect. Yeah, this is fucking perfect. This is comedy story. If you want to hear about it, stick around. <laughs> Check out the Patreon. No, I was going to I was going to say I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking for just the right flooring, you need choices. And at Marshall Carpet One, you'll find thousands of choices, including carpet, hardwood, rugs, and luxury vinyl. So make the right choice and visit Marshall Carpet One and Rug Gallery. And we promise, with more than 50 years as a family-owned business, we've got you covered! Mel Gibson, my mom can't stand him. Right. Because of she thought the lethal weapon should have stopped after the first. <laughs> <laughs> she can't stand him because of the Jew stuff. Sure. And the lethal weapon. Uh, they're, they're all great. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, I mean, not like the first, but I don't, come on. This is go, go, The Jew stuff happened. The Jew stuff happened. mom was upset. Uh, which I get, but also like, <clears throat> he's awesome. Mm -hmm. So I am able to say. Separate the art from the artist. Not, yeah, yeah uh, that's a m much more uh, philosophical conversation, which I'm willing to have. Um, but he, Mel Gibson didn't <laughs> punch Jews in the face and say, you bleed from the nose jew 
He just said eh, the Jews, which is not okay. <laughs> but also, like, everybody has said something. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not defending. But also, I'm not going to not watch his movies. Yeah. I mean, uh, 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 I was at Step Gary. Uh, B- <laughs> Step Daddy, Big Daddy, what's it called? The second Daddy's Home 2. Daddy's Home 2. It's one of the funniest it's movies so of the last five years. Good. Yeah, it's excellent. Yeah. So... <laughs> Mel Gibson doesn't like Jews, so I'm not inviting him over to dinner. Or on the podcast. I would love to have him on the podcast. He's not going to do it, because you're Jewish. Of course, but <laughs> maybe if he understands, there's going to be a balcony, be- uh, a window between us. But my mom won't watch it, and she's not wrong for that. <clears throat> but I will watch him, and I'm not wrong for that. Yeah. And neither one of us think no, that... That's it- great. Nobody's wrong. That's the important thing that I think we missed in 2020. But the problem is <clears throat> me telling my mom she's wrong, or her telling me I'm wrong, which isn't the case, but this is much smaller stakes. Bullseye. Bullseye, my guy. Thank you. The whole thing, trying to force your, your opinion on it onto others, that's the wrong thing. Having your opinion, not wrong. You can go vote for Trump, awesome. But when you're like, if you don't vote for Trump, you're X, Y, and Z, and I, A, B, C, that's the problem. I think that's why um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the, what are they called? The people that knock on the door is for Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses? Mormons. Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> that's why they get such a bad rap. Yeah. Uh, insert produced. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> knock, knock, motherfucker. <laughs> But the real problem, the psychological issue that people have with them is they're telling me what to do. Yeah. If Jehovah's Witnesses were still, you know, they still saw Jehovah and was like, that was fucking crap. I don't know what they believe, but that was crazy what Jehovah just did. Oh, my God. Did you, did you see Jehovah? He was uh, awesome. You know, like, like in Indiana Jones 3, right? Was that, was that Jehovah? Remember when they stepped? You chose wisely. I haven't seen that one. We'll be right back. Whoa, what a great movie. Oh, my God. That was so awesome. I can't believe I haven't seen it before. Um, yeah, this, I'm liking this conversation. I don't know where we are uh, because we just watched a full movie. Yeah, it's been but, hours. But there's something I want to comment on that you said earlier about the white trash thing. Yes. Uh, for right or – excuse me, for white or wrong, I don't know if, if – uh, this is just my opinion on it. Uh, I don't think of white trash as – it, I do think of them as probably white, but not necessarily white. Mm-hmm. And I don't think of them as necessarily trailer park people. Mm-hmm. To me, white trash, and this is and and, and I'm this is maybe gonna not be the most PC thing, but like here on Take Your Shoes Off, I I'm you know people I, I want them to meet me every single time. <laughs> white trash is like people that are like just white trash. You know, like they have thin lips mm-hmm. usually, mm-hmm. and they have they're like they're like just like. Huh? They're like what? You know, they're like they're like loud and and they, they oftentimes are hard of hearing and they need to. They're 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 not they're not diverse. Uh, sure. In their in their appreciations, like white trash <laughs> likes one kind of music. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. White trash is like uh, uh, white trash is Republican. Yeah. Ninety nine out of a hundred times. Sure. Doesn't mean Republicans are white trash. White trash is like the rectangle while Republicans are the square. Yeah, that makes sense. I think to me, white trash is. And this is where I think they smoke not to all smoke. 100 percent. They have to smoke. I don't think that this is this is also I've been reading a lot about generational history, whatever. I've been in the weeds to me a lot. And this is like when the Nashville bombing happened, I was like, oh, it's a white guy. 100 percent. I know it's a white guy. And it was. And the reason I think <clears throat> they are all those things that you're saying. Um, thin lipped. Thin, thin lipped. <laughs> but because I think the part, the important part of white trash is the word white because they feel entitled to be number one on the food chain because of the way society's been. That seems white supremacy, not white trash. Which- uh, this is a different thing. I, I, the, the, there, is, there is a definite difference to me, and I could be wrong, and this is all just opinion. And if you disagree, DM Rick. Um, <laughs> but, but they are still white people who have been conditioned subconsciously or consciously that this is their country and they're the best. I don't think they're out there marching like a white supremacist is. They're not attacking. But they are like, why don't I have more money? And they're like, there is a discontent because they're like, I should be doing better than I am because I'm uh, white. I'm white. And I, I think that that creates a lot of like the discontent and a lot of the anger. I think a lot of the anger comes from, I was told that, you know, this, I'm 
I'm the best and I'm not I'm clearly not the best and they're unhappy with that. That makes sense. I don't know if that's how <laughs> I visualize it, but it is a stig stigmated stigmatized term anyway yeah. and it's it's not going to have positive connotation. No. That what you're saying absolutely makes sense. I feel like that's why all these mass shooters are white. They're, they're, they snap and they're just unhappy with the way things are going. I, I don't broadly. Obviously there's different You have to say women, not broads. Oh, womenly. I mean, obviously, there's different cases. It's case by case, but right. generally speaking. All right. Well, I like this conversation, but I, I want to keep moving forward because yeah. I don't have really yeah, any skin in the fuck? game yeah. on, on that. Yeah. Um, but th I do like the, the conversation that we were having about Twitter and people <laughs> getting mad at people uh, and, and making blanketed statements. And I think and that the problem with that is people not being great writers oh yeah like not being able to <clears throat> target what it is they're saying like and just launching it out and just firing it yeah instead of yeah. saying instead of saying los angeles is so overpopulated and expensive they're saying i fucking hate california right and it's like <laughs> yeah okay but like yeah that's great now you got our attention now get into it yeah and people don't do that and i do wonder sometimes how much of our comedy palette influences the way we see people's perceptions does that make sense what can you elaborate a little bit yeah um when somebody says as a, I'll use the the analogy in comedians yeah. uh, with, with with comedy routines. When somebody says, "Got in a fight with my with my uh, wife the, uh, last night," <laughs> and uh, fucking women, <laughs> they're, they they say one thing, they mean something else. They they don't they're not logical. Yeah. I hate women, but I'm not gonna fuck a guy. I'm not <laughs> gay, you know. It's like. Oh, okay. Tell, tell, tell me more. What do you, what uh, do you say? Yeah. What, what do you give? And, and, and a matter of fact, and, now that we have this subject, now let's not make it about women. Why don't we tell me about your wife? Yeah. And let's, we'll relate right. to the things we do, <clears throat> but it doesn't matter because my wife is women. You know, yeah. my experience with my woman is a big enough sample for me to say what women are. Yeah. And that's not the case. You want to get to the specific, not the general. I, because, yeah. not just because, as a comedian, yes, because the specific is what makes me get to know who you are. Yeah. But also because the general isn't, it isn't accurate. It, it, it's, it's too far away. It's, yeah. it's looking at, at humans from, from the moon. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I, I guess, but like, tell me your experience. Right. Not only do, I, do you now get to k tell me these things where you get to understand what you want to say and express it in a certain way i know oh he he doesn't like his girlfriend because she's this way right. and or he's this way or the trauma and the triggers and i could listen to him i yeah. bet you sia would turn or at least the trumpers would still listen to sia more yeah and by the way i i don't know if sia said anything but he, he, probably not but, but yeah. you know what i mean like <laughs> like if it wasn't like <laughs> fuck trump and fuck anyone who voted for trump but it was yeah. more like you know, fuck Trump, but also yeah. here's more detail. Yeah. I think also the thing that just, I don't know why that reminded me of it, not to double back to it, but uh, double back to it. A lot of the political stuff, and this year was just the, like, this was, you know, the pandemic was brutal and awful and yes, miss, missing our family on the holidays, but also the election was really rough for me and for I'm sure a lot of us, but like a lot of it is regional and there are a lot of Republicans in my family on all sides who I really respect and have great opinions and they're super caring. They're not racist. They're not white trash. They're super generous, but they might live in a small town where the issues of that small town are not at all the issues that you and I see in a big city. And so their point of view on the ground might be completely different than ours. And they don't like what Trump says about race, race, you know, whatever, but they like his Supreme court picks and they like the lower tax, you know, whatever, you know what I mean? So like, because I got into the weeds this year, I can see there's some Republicans voters that I'm like, oh, I understand and I respect your choice and everything's great. And, you know, you're an important person in my life. And then there are some where it's like, oh, you just hate so many. You hate people that aren't you. Well, that's the thing, though. Yeah. Out of sight, out of mind. When you're on the ground looking forward, yeah. you're not worried about skyscrapers. You don't either think it's an issue or you don't care it's an issue. Right. 
And when people from skyscrapers are saying, the air up here is dirty, we need to fix the climate. You guys are fucking idiots. Don't you believe in fucking science? Yeah. The people on the ground aren't hearing the point of view on their girlfriend. They're hearing this pe people hate women. I I'm not going to even yeah. listen. They're insulting me, so fuck them. And then then it's over. Yeah. It's, it's a simple psychology mm -hmm. with person to person. With you, you learn. I remember I learned this in third grade. They they the school taught us to this thing. It was called "You Bug Me," and it was some acronym <laughs> B U G whatever it means. But it was basically be ugly guy. Yeah, uh, maybe, <laughs> probably not. Yeah, it was probably like right. behave, understand guy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's basically like tell people what it is that's bugging you or something yeah. but basically in the way of like how i feel as opposed to what you're doing right it's it's i mean this is psychology 101 but like john you're so fucking loud mm -hmm. Unless you're able to weed through it, it's going to be harder for you to not get defensive as opposed to, John, my ears are really sensitive. Can we lower the volume? Yeah. Um, and it's, that's the whole yelling at thing. And that's what I'm talking about when people are saying online, like, white people fucking suck because blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I know what they're saying is their ears are sensitive. Yeah. I'm, I want to make sure I'm But being a lot of people don't have your awareness. And including the people whose ears are sensitive. Yeah. I feel like I just heard a camera turn off. Yeah, did I? Incidentally, my ears are sensitive. Ah, beautiful. Much better. My you know, I gotta say, John. Yeah. John? Yeah. John. Rick? The, uh, we had a conversation the other day on the phone. About how I'm a horrible actor and I'll never be good? Uh, yeah. I, I, in, in. Can I tell people the, what got me the most about that? What you said on the phone a few days ago? Sure. Rick said in a very because I was you want to set up why we're talking about it just to kind of repilot what we did last episode. Last episode, yeah, just like what it is that we're working on. Is that oh, re for, relevant to the for story? Our pitch, yeah, sure, yeah. Rick and Allison, my wife Allison and I, the three of us are pitching an animated show that Rick and I had the the general the general idea of on this podcast. Yeah, we don't have to give more information than that, but yeah. I think it's fun to document the process along yeah. the way. And it's uh, going a year, well. Like a year ago, a year ago. <laughs> Almost to the day, we improvised and came up with this this game uh, on the podcast, and we've been spending the last year, <laughs> uh, r r you know, working and developing, and, and which we, is longer than usual for people. And we yeah. just got a, a great uh, animation house attached mm -hmm. to it, who who created Rick and Morty. Yep, and um, the production company that the Lonely Island runs is producing it. And so who knows if anything's going to happen? And I don't like to talk too much about it. Could but be a complete miss, but twenty twenty one we'll find out. And uh, it's animated, and uh, uh, John is not going to be a, a, a voice on it. You know, maybe a guest <laughs> voice here or there. I think I should do like the two or three line goofy guy. Yeah, not uh, not an important character. Yes, um, or I walk, <laughs> or I'm off. I'm <laughs> uh, but but we were we were talking on the phone the other day about. Oh, we never got into the waiter thing. I would love to still give that thing about how shows are like restaurants. Sure. But um, we were talking about this yeah. and, and we, we got into just how important writing is and acting is and how they work yeah, together. Yeah, like on The Office, the, it's an A-plus writing staff, plus it's an A-plus actor, acting cast, and you need both. Otherwise, it's kind of whatever. But uh, how important writing is and how important John is. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> just like, uh, you know. Well, and, and, and my thing is what's interesting about that is not just my ego, although that is a part of it. But like as a writer, you don't know if I'm good because who's you, you? any any of these people. No, nobody's read my scripts. Oh, you, you know, people I mean? don't know like, if you're good at writing my product. You don't know what it is. Like, you could see my shows that I worked on. Is that because you didn't create or run the show, or you think that they don't get credit at all? Even so, but even so, like, even if I create, even if our cartoon goes, I'm one of the eight writers. You don't know what's mine. You don't know what's Rick's. You don't know what's Al. You know what so I mean? are you like, saying that nobody knows that Matt Stone and Trey Parker are great? Oh, well, obviously, we know that they're great. But I'm saying, like, in general, like, I. You're the comedian. I see you on stage. I see you on your podcast. I'm the waiter. You're the chef. I see you. Yeah, I see you acting in the, the upcoming Amazon show. But like, you know, I've had comedians ask me for help about like, you know, TV shows or will I read their script and note their script? And I'm always happy to do it. But I'm like, you you only know that I've worked on shows. You don't actually know if I'm a good writer or not. And that's always kind of an interesting. I that makes thing sense. To me. Yeah. Um. And, and not to negate what you're saying because I understand it entirely. Yeah. But just to give a little something. Yeah. To your benefit. People that have never saw Undateable, of which wasn't a great show, and I didn't shine on it by any means. <laughs> Even if <laughs> no, cut to you shining. I'm tired of pretending that we're not together anymore. Sorry. 
I know you told everyone that we only went on one date, but we've gone on a lot of dates. We just spent the night at Lake Michigan at a bed and breakfast. And no, excuse me, miss. I did not tell her friends about it because you promised me not to, but they knew anyway. And you know why that is? Because you actually did tell them? You're da damn right I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he sent pictures of you sleeping. I gotta say, girl, that mouth guard, not cute. <laughs> Straight up, I'm not gonna apologize about that. Cause guess what? I'm proud to be with you. I've wanted us to happen for the past three years, so I'm not gonna lie about it anymore. Listen, no, hold on, hold on. Were you gonna kiss me cause, cause I was gonna, I was still, I was. Oh. You good? I'm in. All right. but if you make one straining noise, we're breaking up. We should go. Clip of, of uh, I don't know. Why I can find a clip of Indatable. We'll find it. Okay. Uh, and um, actually, but not. I didn't always shine. Uh, but people saw. Oh, Rick was on an NBC show. Right. We exactly. give him better for the doubt. Exactly. Yes. And you could be a bad writer. Yes. Who is staffed on a great show? Happens and people happens all the time. So I, I I don't think it's as as, as direct of understanding your true uh, what your abilities are. Right. But when you write on something. Yeah. It's so hard to get a job. Yes. You have, you know, like if you're in the NBA and I never saw you play, chances uh, are, you know, yes. I'm going to be competitive with you, yes. but you're going to win. But it's easier politically for untalented writers to work versus if you're untalented, there's no way you're getting in the NBA. You right. know what I mean? Like you can climb the ladder, you can schmooze, you can have connections or nepotism. There's other non-talented ways to kind of snake through the system. Sure. But like... Allison, who uh, is my wife for people who don't know, and my writing partner, is literally, uh, besides the big boys, w the best writer I've ever seen, just in the room working, just like watching her fix a scene or coming up with an idea or like, you know, the story of the scene is there, but it's not funny. There needs to be something funny. And then she's got it. Like, but nobody knows that, you know, what I mean? and I'm just I, that doesn't bother me. I'm just aware. It's kind of like you're Superman and we see you in the suit and that's Superman, but we're like Clark Kent and you don't know what we do. You know, does that make sense? It makes sense. Uh, yeah. And it's just, it doesn't really necessarily matter. Anyway, we were talking about that. And, and so I was like, I should be an actor. Like I used to be, I, I came, I moved to LA to be an actor and then realized I'm horrible at it. And for a myriad of reasons, uh, but a good writer for using the word reasons. Yeah. And Rick so succinctly on the phone, uh, I was like, Rick, maybe, you know, some actors get their first series regular role and they're like 40, 45, maybe I'll be the dad in 10 years or something. And Rick was like, John, 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 if you were able to be present in a scene and react honestly and, and like act scenes, you would have already done it by now. <laughs> <laughs> He's essentially like, you can't teach tall. It's, it's like the basketball synonym. Like. Yeah. Uh, and, and then. <laughs> And then you're like, oh, so and you were playing like, oh, yeah, so you're right. I guess I just got to get better. I'm going to start acting and blah, blah. I'm like, John, that game that you're playing right now where yeah. like you don't understand what I'm telling you and you, you have this point of view, deliver that authentically. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I guess I'm going to have to yeah. like, yeah. like try and be serious. Give me like a line for real. I'll try my absolute best right now for sure. Um, uh, I'll give you a line that also that I feel you could tap into. Okay. Uh, to make it easier. Okay. Um, I understand why I haven't been able to be a good actor. <laughs> I need to be able to be more vulnerable. And to do that, I have to understand myself. You could, yeah. you know, improvise the words. But, like, <laughs> tell me seriously. Like, you're, let's have, we'll do this. I'll give you a lead in. Yeah. I'll be talking to you. And then. Mm-hmm. You have the realization yeah. that I, I before feel, before dialogue realization. 
Uh, yeah, or okay. or if you want to lead Check into it, out. you could talk. So we're, we're watching you have a, a yeah. light bulb moment yeah. and express to me what that oh, light bulb moment is. No problem. I hope casting directors are watching. Right? Acting isn't acting isn't easy. It's not hard. It's just it's just being there, and being yeah. there could be hard. And it's hard in my own life. Like there's a ton of times that I'm not even present in real life because I'm thinking about a hundred things. I'm I'm too aware. I know that I'm on your patio and I'm talking. Like I need to find a way. But I got it. Check this out. Ready? Give me a lead in. That was it, man. Oh, what? <laughs> I was thinking like, this is good. When is he gonna have his moment? That was I was really thinking like, yeah, we'll have your moment. It's it's a little wordy. <laughs> well, fuck. Uh, no, 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 just, just try it. But use that. That's what. Okay, that's yeah. what. That's it is. what it is. And also, this is um, uh, ha ha ha. But also very serious. Yeah. Like, so corny and and self indulgent. Mm. But this is my process, and yeah. I think I'm I, I'm You're I'm one of the great. best actors in L.A. That's what you have to do. You have to make yourself believe bad acting. Yeah. You have to make yourself believe what's happening is real. Yeah. Find a way of thinking like, is this conversation real or not? I understand. It's always I understand. real. I understand why I'm not a good actor. Bad. You can't do it. <laughs> no, dude, I got it. I got it. I got it. It has to be, yeah. So acting, a, a, a great exercise and also a way to make a great living mm. is... If you're able to just play one character, play it perfectly and yeah. play yourself. Easy. It's, it's not a, it's not as, well, what do you mean? I could just tap into my own life. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to stick to writing and it's, it's not for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, acting, acting a lot of times people liked, people say that, oh, he's so one note. He sucks. He might be one note or she, the woman might be one note, but. There, it's a you. It's middle it's a, C. It's an amazing note. It's yeah. an amazing note. Yeah, and uh, being able to play yourself is not being yourself. Yeah. It's just the the subconscious and conscious choices you're making are easier to get to because you you have practice. Yeah. What would I do in this fictitious situation? When you're a character actor, there's a lot of steps. But to me, the main two, and this is going to sound silly, is an amazing voice. When people could do voices. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, but when people could do dialects <laughs> or voices, yeah. it's, it blows my mind. Amir, we've talked oh, about this. Oh, he's one of the best. Who we've had on the pod. We'll put up the blah, blah, blah. Um, he does voices. So, But when you do yeah. a voice, the best I could connect to it is when I wear a fake mustache or when I chew gum. <laughs> it's very character-y, but there's something about like, I'm somebody else now. When Brad Pitt eats... Yeah, you're you're, you're yeah. like, it's easy to be present in action. A anyway, yeah. I, I don't. I'm, this yeah. is going on too I'm much. I'm not going to be able to do it. So you, we understand. I, but as a <laughs> as a voice on a cartoon show, yeah. If you could be John trying to do that thing, you know, you just have to write for it. Yeah. So let's what let's let's give you a scene that okay, you th what what situation do you think you thrive in? Um, I hyping up, hyping up, energy loud, yeah. Hype for sure. Okay, now now what's fun is as you as we might know from our deconstruction of Tyler Perry's Meet the Whites. Should we cut to a clip? Um, <laughs> sure. Tyler Perry, Meet the Whites, is actually one of my favorite ones because we did a style of comedy known as uh, taking something silly very seriously. There's a clip in Tyler Perry that's kind of controversial where it looks like Rick is giving my character a blowjob out of loving the show so much. But guess what? We didn't plan that. Rick dropped something or was picking something up. I don't remember. You're going to have to talk to him. Uh, it's a funny video. There's a controversial part in that uh, where because the camera's so tight, it looks like I'm blowing John because I pop into frame. And I told him I dropped something. Uh, and you know, we just keep going. Obviously, we're not going to stop because of that. But the truth is, I was trying to blow him in the video. <laughs> Stupid. But it came out really funny. I think it, com it comes out good. I always wanted to throw in our old sketches. Sorry. We should we should we should yes. put in some some of those uh, greatest hits real. But you said something you said something in there that uh, they just heard. I don't remember exactly what it was, but um, we did something that's known as taking. A oh yeah 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 yeah. Uh, you know something and then like 
flipping it on its head. I don't know what the word it's is. Like, it's so like obvious. We did a form of comedy known as taking something that's not very serious, but treating it very seriously. Right. <laughs> Which is very funny because it's so simple and obvious. But also, yeah. that's a simple and obvious situation yeah. to play in. So we're going to have you be loud hype guy. Yeah. But we're going to put you in a situation where loud hype guy it isn't appropriate. Right. So uh, <laughs> we are going to put you at... Uh, a uh your at the uh, your grandmother okay. just uh no 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 your grandfather oh okay just passed away yeah and um you uh your cousin was supposed to do the eulogy mm -hmm. but for own personal reasons can't yeah and or won't yeah and um it's fine. We could have moved on. Yeah. But you feel people are waiting for a eulogy from one of the, one one of the, of the kids. children. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> okay, you decide. Got it, got it. <laughs> Fuck this. Guys, sorry about that. Cousin's not here. Whatever. Crying. Emotions. Whatever. This dead guy right here was a legend, bro. Okay? Robert crushed. He came from nothing, and now he's rich as hell, and we're going to miss the fuck out of him. But that's my grandpa, dude. That's my guy. <laughs> the thing that I, this bit is reminding me of is my real grandpa's eulogy. And in real life, when my grandpa died, I had to give the eulogy, and I just started sobbing so much uncontrollably that my cousin had to, like, tag me out to finish it. Uh, it was, when did that happen? It happened, like, five plus years ago. And... I was like, I was sad. It sucked. I remember. It was like a hero. That was of like mine. the first. Didn't you not cry until later? Was that? It was yeah. It was like a Mary Tyler Moore episode, the famous crying episode. But it was like. That's the girl from Nick at Night. Yes, <laughs> yes. But yeah, like I, 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 we got. I got in the room before it started, and I, I went to the bathroom and started crying. And then I thought that I had it under control, and it was literally. It was it, if it wasn't a funeral, it would be funny. I was like, I was going to give my speech, and I was at the podium. I was at the microphone. Everybody was looking at me, and. I said like four words and I just started sobbing and it was so unintelligible that you could, but I kept trying to say the words, but you couldn't even understand what, what language I was speaking. I was just We'll sobbing. cut to a clip. <laughs> As you all know, I was very, I was very close to my grandfather when I was told he passed away. I was, sh I was shocked, but when, <laughs> that when I was asked to write this, you. When I was asked to write this eulogy, I decided to keep it in my pocket with my Montreal uh, uh, stand-up intro and my backup plan. So I wouldn't lose it. <laughs> um, my grandfather wasn't just a hotel owner. He was, uh, he was a father, a husband, uh, and he was, he, was all, he was all black. He was my only all black grandfather. Um, and the man, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, and then my cousin had to just tap me out and, and do it for me. <laughs> do you think you could do that again now? No. I know, I 100% I know that that's how, what acting is and that's what makes people talented. There's no, I never tapped into that before. I've never been able to sense. I don't want to sense. Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, there's a game uh, that I like to play and I first played it. Um, Chris D'Elia actually introduced it to us on Undateable. It was, uh, I think it was on the tour, whatever it was. We did it in the, in the dressing room sometimes too. Singing with your friends. Do, did you ever, do you know about this? No. It was everybody, we're all in a room, and we, we take turns, and we pick a song, mm -hmm. right? And you have to sing the song, but there's no comedy. You have to really try oh as God. hard as, there's, unless you're a, prof even if you have a good voice, yeah. unless you're a professional, I find, and uh, I feel like I need to say this because I'm insecure otherwise, this side, like, separately is a bit that I do, just yeah. about the vulnerability of singing. Yeah. There's something so, so when you're in a group full of people and yeah. you, you watch, there's something very. And you actually try to sing. You really try and sing yeah. the best you can, which might be okay, but like there's something vulnerable about trying and not succeeding with flying colors. Yeah. Or it makes people, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So. And the, I'm tone deaf. So like it's, uh, I'm a nightmare. 
for singing. But, but, but when you do, like, let me hear an example of you trying to sing. <clears throat> National Anthem. Oh, say can you see? Was that The anything? best I've ever heard you. That's good. For real? Yeah, it's the best <laughs> I've ever heard you. Because normally you yeah, lean baby. into it. Keep going. By the dawn's early light. What, what is that word? By the what? Dawn's early light. It sounded like you said dawn's early. <laughs> okay. What so proudly we had. See, joking. <laughs> no, I'm not. No way. That I was swear real. to you, I'm not. Why'd you I, go so low Because flat? whenever I hear it on TV, the guy always goes low there. What so proudly we hail. Let me hear that part again. <laughs> Don't let me hear the what so proudly we hail. What so proudly we hail. Flat, but better. And then I don't know the next words. <laughs> um, <laughs> What's so proudly we Twilight's. Uh, the, the twilight's less uh, gleamy. <laughs> and the rock. Who's broad stripes? <laughs> Wait, what? Who's broad stripes? Doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but for you, because you play the I can't sing well game a lot on Instagram, yeah, sure. it's easy for you to tap into. Yeah, I just have to, I have to, just have to try. And now here's the bad. hard one. Yeah. I want to see you try and tap into your grandfather's eulogy and see if you could actually get sad and cry. I don't think I can. Like, what are we, ta like, what are we talking about? Do you rem When he passed away, yeah. you didn't have a written eulogy, did you? Man, I might have blacked that stuff out. I don't even know. I think I did. I must have. I must Spoke have had in the some, heart. I must have had some bullet points or something. Let me hear. Oh my god. Oh jeez. We'll um, be pushing in and put some yeah. uh, music. But treat it. Yeah. No jokes. Well, obviously, he was a hero of mine. Um, I would probably say something to the effect don't, of. No, no, no. You're saying it to the effect. No, probably. Oh, I, I'm, this uh, is, ladies this and is gentlemen, John DeWalt. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, my grandfather was a great man. He came from very humble beginnings and lived a strong life. He raised three kids. He was a great husband. He was faithful to his wife. Um, he provided for everybody. He led by example and he, he invested well, you know, his accomplishments are obvious. He... There's a, the reason I keep a picture of him and me on my desk is because he motivates me to work hard and to keep going and to work a little bit harder than the next guy. And hopefully I can provide for Allison what he was able to provide for my grandmother. <laughs> the end. <laughs> yeah, I guess I got there a little bit. We'll Oof. be right back after a word from our sponsors. Country Road. Let me let me do it first. I got it. That, that was the let one. Let me get Country I Road. I promise you that was good. But let me get out okay. Country Road. Country Road. Take me home to the right place. I belong <coughs> West Virginia. Mountain Mama. Country Road, America. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. Um, did you feel like you were acting? No, it felt it felt it felt real, but it, it's also horrible. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. It's just living those moments. I mean, people people who go through traumatic experiences mm -hmm. are easily more easily able to tap into them because they still have those emotions and those feelings. Mm -hmm. That was great. My eyes got watery. I saw it happening with you. I just feel like I have the defense, the Chandler Bing defense of like the comedy walls go up. And I, I, I don't always, I love crying at a TV show. I, I'll cry at 40% of the office episodes. Rebecca runs out super excited and she says, wow, I've spent all these years reaching for Evan Drake and Robin Colcord and I ended up marrying a plumber. And Sam says, <laughs> Sam says, <laughs> Sam says, you did good, sweetheart. <laughs> and she says, and she says, I did, didn't I? And then she leaves, and that's her last line of the show. Because he's talking about, of course, replacing Shelly. Anyway, that's how it ends for Rebecca. <laughs> that was me 
truly explaining the finale of Cheers, which is a great, one of the best endings of TV of all time. I find that I have an easier time being emotional and vulnerable to the fi fictional storytelling than the real stuff and i don't know i haven't, haven't even had that traumatic of a life so wait wait i'm sorry you you haven't it's easier to it's to, easier for me to get there quote unquote thinking about cheers of the office but you got or, there with your real life grandpa but i've never done that before you just gave me this exercise uh -huh. i've never even so what thought. is the point that you're making because you, you said the chandler being comedy walk Can i you explain feel that like differently? i feel like i whatever real emotions i have i release them when i'm watching Art. So you're able you're shows. able to empathize with other people. Yes. Right. Yes. But you said. But what does that have to do with the comedy? I world? don't often look at myself and do it for my own stuff. Could I shine a light on something? Yes. You don't often look at yourself. Yes. What's that? What do you mean? How do you not look at yourself? Or why don't you look at yourself? I don't. I don't like in my. I don't sit around thinking about you know missing my grandfather or you know growing up poor or whatever. I. But if I'm watching The Office and it's a business school episode where Michael tells Pam that he's proud of her and they have a father or daughter moment, I'm instantly crying. So you're able to I empathize can, with, uh, connect to your life through other people's analogous storytellings. Yeah. What it I want to hear more about the comedy wall. Is it yeah, because like, you have to be funny? What is it? What do you mean? What's the comedy wall? I just connect to Chandler's use of comedy uh and could you explain that, friends, that the character trait yeah he uses comedy to handle anything so if you're talking for him it's his uh cross-dressing father which in the 90s i guess was something to be embarrassed about it's his his slutty mom who had sex which with in Ross, the 90s was nothing to which be embarrassed in the 90s about. was totally cool and awesome <laughs> Man, uh, those flipped huh? yeah <laughs> i don't care if my dad wears a dress as long as my mom doesn't suck a whole bunch yes, of kicks yes um, but the way he copes is he just makes a ton of jokes and he's super funny. And if he's in an awkward s situation, like the funniest one that, that is so over the top is in season one, he, he spills the beans to Rachel that Ross likes her. And she's like, what did you just say? And the audience is like, oh, and Chandler's like, Flav, Flavin, Flay. And he just starts like making like crazy sounds. And like, he's very uncomfortable and he's just trying to not be in that situation instead of explaining to her oops i made a mistake i'm so sorry like he's just he wants out he just uses jokes um and i do just, you think was, that's that's a comedians that do that or is that people i think i'm sure a lot of comedians do that and i'm sure a lot of people do that just you're deflecting right deflecting but also just being more because like even on the thing i just did with you where i got emotional talking about my grandpa it was awkward for me transitioning out and getting back to normal I would love to touch on, uh, and is this conversation ridiculous to you? I'm, I'm so loving this conversation. No, it's great. I love the real stuff. Um, you know? the, uh, that, that thing that you said about it was an awkward transitioning or uncomfortable. Yeah. That's a pocket for me. Not for yes. right or wrong. Yes. It just is. And I think there's a perception that people have with uncomfortable yeah. where it's stigmatized as bad. Yeah. We don't want to feel uncomfortable. Why? Now, I mean, there's, I could argue either side. Obviously, there's a lot of reasons why feeling uncomfortable. You know, I want, you want comfortable clothes, comfortable chairs. You don't want to be around racist people. You want right. the food to taste good. I mean, comfortable is so obviously a great thing. Yeah. But uncomfortable is, and this is corny, but uncomfortable is a perception, right? It's just out of your comfort zone by yeah. definition. Well, what if it were in your comfort zone? How do you get it in your comfort zone? Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. But... Having a visceral reaction to something that's uncomfortable and immediately shutting it down as in either deflecting it, choosing to not be in environments where it could happen or letting it throw you off. What, go ahead. Yeah, I don't mean to say I know what you're saying and everything you're saying is correct. I was not uncomfortable. I just meant like I was probably on camera awkward getting into the next thing. Like it wasn't a smooth like. I am also, un I'm fine to be uncomfortable. I understand that people aren't, but I wasn't like, I was like sweating, like, oh my gosh, this is the worst. I was just like, wow, I just got emotional thinking about my grandpa. Now what, what, how do I pivot back to? I understand. Yeah. Jeremy pivot. How do I Jeremy pivot? What yeah. was your point then of saying that then you got uncomfortable? It's just new to me. I never right. really cr cry about real stuff. I mean, I obviously I do, but like, I guess my family wasn't overly emotional uh, and I was an only child, so I was alone a lot. So there wasn't like a lot of like, oh man, I had a, such, the bullies were mean to me today. Oh, you know, it's just like, all right, now I go home and play PlayStation. Like, who cares? Right. Like, and I don't even know if that's, again, I had a pretty great life. Like, nothing really crazy happened. 
<laughs> just like, there's a beautiful montage yeah. of your life that we yeah, put together. Just crushing. <laughs> you don't even see it. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, I'm a lot of times like my nieces Ava and Anna when they started when they realized I cry at movies all the time, they would love to show me sad movies and they would wait for me to cry because it's funny to them to see an adult cry. I wouldn't be un- un- uncomfortable. At all. I would I would openly sob for them and uh, mm-hmm. they would laugh and think it was hilarious that their uncle was crying and I would have no problem being on display. But when it's a, when it's about my own actual stuff, I don't have that much experience with it. I mean, I cried at my wedding when Allison walked down the aisle. So did I. And yeah, that was very. I could get there right yeah, away. Like, it was water, like yeah. she was Watching a rock you got star. Me, yeah, got, got, got me a lot. And so that was awesome, and I had no problem. Like it wasn't like I'm crying. I have to stop. It was just like this just rarely it happens. An, it was for an me. appropriate time for you. You've decided that that's an appropriate time to be yeah. vulnerable. Oh man, she was so beautiful. But yeah, it was just like. It was that. It was the eulogy. I don't. I've never really cried other than that about real things, for myself. Yeah. Because I, I probably truthfully haven't had that many too. But also, so when it comes time to act and do the scene and do whatever, I don't. I just don't have the experience doing it. Uh. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the there's no point of the 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 exercise as corny as I call that. It, um. You know, I'm, I'm not an acting coach, and nor are you saying you want to get you clearly better could at acting. Be. I think I'd be a great acting coach. Yeah. I really do. You just got me there, and I'm one of the worst. But, but um, <laughs> to uh, I as a as a performer seek out those moments. Yeah. For a few reasons. One, it's part of my comedy voice. Now I accidentally or intentionally or a combination of the two developed this voice in this thing. Mm-hmm. But one of the reasons I I did from a defensive place. Um, one of the reasons is. In those awkward moments, if I could feel it, if I could feel uncomfortable, and I don't mean feel uncomfortable by like cussing out a woman or doing something that like people are are unhappy. I don't mean it in a negative way. I just mean it in a vulnerable way. Yeah. If I could get myself to feel that, then it literally writes itself. It's the best. There's, there's, you know, there's a lot of different formulas. Well, there's not a lot. There's a few, but one of the simple formulas is uh, take a person and put them in a uncomfortable situation Mm -hmm. and then you play and all these jokes without this situation are just jokes it's funny you said i i I think that that's that's also one of my favorite places for comedy and there's an episode of the office called scott's tots where uh top three yeah exactly top Top three episode it's a top episode for sure and I was scrolling through Instagram randomly, and it was one of those office Dunder Mifflin meme things. And all the comments on it were from like young Gen Z people who were like, that's the worst episode. Like, it's so cringy. I can't even watch it. I hate that episode. It's my favorite show, but that's the one episode that I will never watch. And every, everyone felt that way about. So it's like younger people don't want to live in that uncomfort. But for me, when Michael Scott promises these kids tuition and can't do it and they're singing for him and they're rapping for him and he's sitting there, he has nothing for them. And, <laughs> and that's it's so honest. I would kill to write a situation that strong. Like, yeah. and so when I was reading these comments, I was like, are you guys, what are you talking about? Is that about? a new generation or is that just what people of any generation are like when they're teenagers before they understand? Understand the, the richness of yeah. it and then the power of, of an di- un- uncomfortable moment? Yeah, maybe. But I mean... For people that don't watch the show or that episode for whatever reason, yeah. it's a very honest situation where 10 years ago, Steve Carell's character, Michael Scott, kind of wasn't thinking much of it, wanted to motivate this this uh, this, this school of, of kids who, who uh, are underprivileged yeah. and says... If you guys graduate high school, I will pay for your college. So now, <laughs> yeah. t- t- yeah. we well, never heard about this before. Yeah, but the episode opens yeah. up with with the, this letter from the school, and then Stan is just laughing because obviously the yeah. whole office knows yeah. for the past decade, yeah. Michael Scott's gonna have to come up with yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> yeah. to pay these, and he has to go to the school yeah. and watch these kids. Thank you, Michael Scott, for yeah. all that you do. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just oh yeah. And they're like backflipping for him uh-huh. and like rapping and stuff. And they're all black and they're all like, and he's just this white businessman. And he's like, <laughs> they're like, this guy's going to pay for my college. Anyway, it's just such like the whole UK office is built on yeah. uncomfortable situations. And so for when I was reading people being like, I don't like that. I want a comfortable comedy. I was like, what? 
so my 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 thoughts on that are not that uncomfortable comedy is the only form. No, it's just it's just a great one. And not and also in that same formula, it doesn't have to be uncomfortable with a person. It just could be fish out of water. It could be you know high stakes, low yeah, stakes. Yeah, planes, trains, automobiles. Yeah. Um, but when I was able to, uh, when you have the jokes without the situation, it doesn't work. Right. It's just, I mean, maybe if that's your right. style. I mean, jokes are great. I love yes. jokes and they're funny. Yes. But I mean, sitcoms by definition are situational comedies. Yes. And being able to, I remember you pointed this out to me, and I don't know if I didn't think about it beforehand, but I definitely didn't have this appreciation. Um, on Undateable, I think it was season one, uh, my character had this game where they were they were mermaiding a girl or whatever it was it was like tell a girl you have no legs what was it how does um, or tell a girl you could breathe underwater or ignore her or i think it was just you just don't talk why was it called mermaiding i think it was because because mermaids, mermaids don't, talk. don't talk because they're underwater i think yes that must be it. but i think that the bit was you're so annoying and such a piece of shit asshole that whenever you talk to girls they hate you so you should just not talk just smile at her wave at her be nice to her but never speak and she'll be into you. that was the first episode of uh, and one of only a few where i felt i was being funny in it yeah and the reason is uh i had a game to play that was episode two by the way um yeah. Uh, I had a game to play, mm -hmm. and that uh, me being quiet in front of a girl isn't necessarily funny. Mm -hmm. But if you understand the situation behind it, yeah. it's, it is funny. I I don't know if it's unrelated or coincidentally. Um, last week I posted an episode of this test thing I was doing with Esther, where we were gonna maybe do a, like this little spin-off thing. Yeah. And we I was talking about my difficulty of repeating material, and she's like, "That's what stand up is," and yeah. blah blah blah. And I'm mm -hmm. like, "Oh no, I understand. I, I I have been, and I do it. It's just an obstacle for me." Um, but what I like to do more than that is I like to write games. And she was laughing and making fun of me and how corny that was. And it's like, I, I guess. But, like, seriously, like, you still have jokes within games. Yeah. But the game, games are situations. Game is a fertile place for jokes. Yeah. So, sure. so once people know the game I'm playing, then everything, in a way, becomes a callback. Yeah. I mean, that's 100% right. A Allison and I did a short with Melissa Villasenor. And... There's this opening scene, and the opening scene's pretty good. And then there's like a planning scene, and that, that's pretty good. But once they get into the heart of the story and the situation where they've kidnapped this guy and they're trying to kill this guy, but they don't know how, it all takes off. Now there's a, a unlimited jokes because they're fish out of water in this crazy, high stakes situation. And it, it, yeah, it, it, everything comes much easier if you're in. If you're like Bursky on Undateable, and you don't have a story this week. You only have like three random lines. It's very hard to comment on other people's story and have really funny lines versus if, you, if it's your B story, you're the one who's doing the game. Now you're, yeah, you have stuff to play. You have emotion. You have, yeah. you have everything. Yeah. So to tying that into the stand-up, jokes are still important, but having a situation. Now you could have fictitious situations that everybody is in on. For example, yeah. all right, this time you're going to play, you're at your grandfather's eulogy. We all are in on this together. Yeah. The version I like to do, and where there was even some confusion with us, where you're like, okay, I'm ready. And I'm like, no, I was doing it. Yeah, that is, was it. Yeah. Is playing this situation, and I'm not trying to fool the audience, but at the same time, I can't tell them it's what I'm doing, or by design, we're not in the situation anymore. Yeah. We are observing the situation. So to build a situation that we're all in together, it could be uncomfortable. Right. I don't want the audience to be uncomfortable and not enjoy themselves. It's just that's the design. It's like spicy foods could hurt your tongue. Scary movies could give you nightmares. But the point nightmares. of it is the inner. What's that? You said nightmares. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, nightmares. <laughs> so play, sitting in the situation where I'm feeling vulnerable, even yeah. if I'm playing, you know, some real, some not. If I'm uncomfortable and vulnerable, I am there. You have ammo. Uh, and I'm present. I'm mm -hmm. in it. I'm, I'm really nervous right now. Yeah. You know, and I'm I, and, and I'm really on my toes. Yeah. And I f and it, f and when I'm doing that on stage, and I apologize if this is so self indulgent, but while I'm on stage and I feel that thing, I feel. I've used this example before, like, but I had the star in Mario where I could run into the bad yeah, guys yeah, yeah. because it's all right. Yeah. Because everything I'm doing is at least honest. Yeah. And now they might be uncomfortable, but I can't tell them, don't worry. I am, I am doing this all intentionally. Yeah. And I know what I'm, I've been doing this for a decade. I got it. I can't say that to them. Right. But then these jokes that are just little tiny jokes in this real thing. Yeah. Fucking, I deliver it the best. People are feeling it. 
most, the three, my three favorite, and maybe there are more, but the three favorite that I think of when I said top three episodes of The Office are Scott's Tots, Business School, and uh, Dinner Party. Of course. Are those your three favorite? Um, not in that order. Dinner, not dinner order Party either. is three, Business School is one for me, and Scott's Tots would be further down the list, but it's, it's up there. So uh, that's fair. The reason I put Scott's Tots is specifically for the last act. Yeah. But... Those they all have great jokes and stuff, but the reason why those resonate with me is is uh, in business school, he cares about his business and the people and yeah. the situation's funny. He's throwing the candy bar. It's yes. on its own. It's hysterical. Yes. But like I care and I believe and I see him. Mm-hmm. I see him not being aware. Yeah. I see him. I see me in him. Yeah. You know I. That doesn't happen without uncomfortable feelings because. You can't appreciate the sunny days without the rain. Like right. there has to be a resolution, a resolve, an arc. Yeah. And you know, he's not, not defensive, but talking in the stand-up again. People are like, "Oh, he's uncomfortable. He makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. He's polarizing." I'm fucking having. You know, I'm not saying that I'm the king, but I'm. <laughs> I have an arc. I'm making people feel things. I'm. I yeah. have a conflict resolution without people even consciously recognizing there was a conflict to begin with. And that's why you should be passed at the comedy store. Hoodie, uh, the hat again. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but you know. it's funny that Esther was was making fun of you for writing games when she does the same thing. A- a- any comedian who's at that level um, has developed a personality and a point of view, and that is their game. Right. So Esther's game is uh, I'm in LA. I'm an LA two, but a Midwest seven, and you know, doing the young stuff and yeah. doing the ugly stuff, and I'm a I'm a mean bitch to Rick, and I'm a dumb bitch, or, or like all that stuff. Uh-huh. Because everyone knows her persona, yeah. she can lob jokes off of that persona. Like you were saying, Chandler. Yeah, exactly. So Esther's noting you for the thing that she does. So. Uh, for a little, a little, uh, uh, a little sitcom math that because uh, you're so good at breaking this stuff down, <laughs> and I feel like I could do it, but you're better. Um, <laughs> but maybe I'll add some of my thoughts on it. Okay. Um, I guess we could do Fresh Prince because that's. You know, it's top two for me, and I know it's one of your faves. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's oh, math. I cried, I cried that show too. There's math in that, which is the the game. There's games and the situations, and then there's games which are basically just character traits. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I, I could do it, but I would love for you to break down the characters of Fresh Prince and their character traits and w- why they do it, or you know, and and also another one that I'd love for you to do um, is tell me. In a few sentences, what Fresh Prince is, why it works, the fish out of water. Explain those. You get oh, it. man. I mean, Fresh Prince's characters are well, the reason the show is better than. First of all, the show is, you have to say, the show is so great because it's written by and starring black talent. And the reason that's so important to the story of the show is the Banks family acts like, if you were just listening or just reading it, they act like a rich white family. Carlton is a super Republican. They go to the tennis club. They don't, they don't only act white. They act stereotypically rich white, Bel Air, snob, whatever. And the fact that they're black makes it so powerful for multiple reasons. Number one, it's awesome to see them succeeding in America in a land that has not always been fair to them. But number two, the episode where Carlton and Will get pulled over and Will is from Philadelphia, and he's like, we're about to get arrested. And Carlton's like, what are you talking about? We're driving in a Mercedes, and we're getting pulled over by a white cop. We're about to get arrested. We're black. And Carlton's like, no, this is an officer of the law. He's going to help us get on our way and help us find the right exit. <laughs> and, of course, they get arrested, and Carlton can't accept. He doesn't understand. He's had this privileged life. He hasn't had to, to struggle the way Will has had. And there, this, the episode ends, and it's. I wish they would do more of it. It's, it's in season one. It's one of the only ones in season one that – ends on a powerful note like that but Carlton cannot accept that they were arrested because they're black and he's like dad isn't this this isn't true this isn't true Will isn't this, it's because we were driving wrong it's because we were driving wrong and Will I forget Will has an amazing line that I forget he says essentially no Will exits Carlton's alone on the couch and I get emotional thinking about it this is after this right well this is after because yeah. before that there was a great beat too where uh, they're they're in the police station yeah. and the police are not giving him any and then they find right. out who he is and then will their dad comes in 
and threatens these lawsuits on him and he just destroys them and they let him out right mm -hmm. away. And they tells him that it was his boss, his boss's car and he had permission to drive the car. And how they, it shouldn't matter yeah. that I'm a judge. Because what if, what about people who don't have judges as a father? Yeah, exactly. And so essentially they are arrested for stealing a car that they didn't steal. And Uncle Phil goes, he goes, I will bury you in so many lawsuits that your grandchildren will need lawyers. Uh, and there's a huge studio audience applause. But it, and the episode ends with Carlton alone. Will leaves and Carlton is just alone. This black, you know, stereotypical white Republican Bel Air guy. Yeah, this white guy who just found out he's black. He's a white guy who just found out he's black. And he's like, it's because we were driving wrong. And he's just sitting there alone. And he's like, it's because we're driving wrong. And the camera pans up and he's just alone and he just he, he can't accept yeah because of the way he was raised and you could, obviously couldn't do that if they were white um side note i love i love there not being a resolution on that yes because intentional or not the subtext of that means from every episode thereafter he can't ex he yeah he, he kind of maybe he knows it but he just doesn't really accept it and how great that a, that a silly joke heavy multi-camera sitcom can do something that's so powerful and important like he was raised in Bel Air. He's rich. He's got the best school. He's a privileged person. And then all of a sudden, he's not. He's, and that's he's an a, uncomfortable feeling. Yeah. It's racism exposed, yeah. explained, mm -hmm. and experienced to somebody firsthand for the first for time. For the first time. That's the situation because of the character trait of stereotypically white. And at the same time, you could switch that situation and have it be that he is in will's hometown for the first time and will thinks carlton will never make it and yeah. carlton meets some of his friends and then the second act comes in and he is now taken on this this uh will smith archetype structure yeah. and now he's this tough guy from and seeing that's like seeing a white guy acting black yeah and it's the same exact game yeah excuse me same exact math of it but just played differently and it's great too because in that episode the whole show fresh prince is will's a fish out of water he's the he's a poverty poor kid in this house but in that episode carlton's a fish out of water because will knows what's going on will's been here before this guy's arresting us and carlton is just like a complete virgin to it and so the premise flips for that episode and it's great. I don't know if this is boring for people, but this is the end of the episode. So if you made it this far, you're probably enjoying it. <laughs> but I still want you to break down, uh, give me like the, the two, three sentence pitch of what Fresh Prince is. And then, and I would say Fresh Prince because it's the, one of the best shows of all time, but also everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of the character traits of, of each of the cast members. So we could explain how we could write games for it. Does that make sense? Not really. And uh, Carlton, Carlton uh, acts white, um, and uh, Hillary is uh, 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 very uh, 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 spoiled. Spoiled. So mm -hmm. there's situations where she's so unaware she takes her daddy's credit card. Like there's mm -hmm. all these. Basically, the point I'm making is you can have the most basic, simple character yeah. traits, and the difference between um, a character that sucks and a character that feels multidimensional is just having three character traits instead of one. Uh -huh. If Monica from Friends only cared about being clean, that wouldn't be enough. But when you add in the the relationships, the, mm. the sister, the brother, all these things. That's why Michael Scott is a good salesman. That's why like that episode in The Office is so important to see him at Chili's with Tim Meadows and he gets the huge sale his way by being too yeah. loud, by being too talkative, by being charismatic, not by the book works and so you're like oh and we only see him being a good salesman five times five, yeah, five or six times and that's enough yeah Be yeah and and i mean i'm, I'm nerding out a little bit now yeah. but it, it's it so buys you it buys you everything otherwise everything. you're just i'm this dumb guy and i'm the boss then he's just why, why is he the boss right exactly yeah so when yeah. you have these right rich characters it doesn't mean you don't need eight seasons of game of thrones yeah you just have to have a couple of things give me a moment yeah and it's like in real life this guy that i don't like Tony Hinchcliffe obviously was on here talking shit about me and uh, we've DM'd and talked about it. He has a lot of strong opinions about me that I don't agree with, but then he's got like two or three things that I think he's so talented at. And so it's like, you can take a character and be like, Oh, you know, Michael Scott is, is, is unaware and he's a narcissist and he, are you, are you saying that like, Tony is your Michael Scott? Yeah. Example? Like I'm saying, I'm saying it works because it's true of everybody. Right. From from a point of view, uh, people, it's like yelling from the skyscrapers. Yeah, people hate me because of X, Y, and Z. I'm too narcissistic on Instagram by posting my abs too much, and you know whatever. But then they see, oh, he's a really great father. You know, like everybody, even people save you, the cat. Even people you don't like have two or three things. Everybody is good at something, 
And like when, yeah. when Tony Hinchcliffe was on your thing making fun of your old apartment, I remember from that episode, I was laughing out loud. He, was, he destroyed you. He's so good at that stuff. Um, and I DM'd him and I was like, you know, mm -hmm. I disagree with a lot of what you said about writing. But at the end of the day, to uh, Tony, Rick, and me were at the comedy store in 2010. Poor, you were a waiter, I was a dog walker. I think Tony was living in his car. We were doing the Sunday open mic once a week, two minutes. And all three of us have you know, careers in comedy and that's awesome. So even though we all take different paths, there's still a respect and an understanding of achievement in the same, the tree of comedy, you know, he's a stand up. I'm and where is this? What are you tying this to? I'm just saying like, even a guy who was on your podcast blasting me, uh, I, c I can find a lot in common with, and right, I can right, find right, a right. lot of connection to. That's the, uh, that's the game. Yeah. Character traits was you were saying with Esther or the situation of, uh, going to somebody's business school and being a fish out of water there, mm -hmm. being able to play games isn't it is that's the that's that's th TV that's and it's not just comedy yeah no it's everything yeah uh, I mean watch I just watched an episode of The West Wing where and I'm sorry if this is boring for everybody but like for this one episode the nar there's a narrator and it's the characters writing their parents emails and that's the game of this episode and it's not in any of the other episodes but for this week. There's a narrator, and that informs our scenes, and that uh, informs how we structure the scenes. With uh, games, put everything on a platter. So instead of having all these different things, some of them might have something in common. You know, the A story and the B story might not be connected. Right. But if it's all within the same game, even if they they they're always parallel, they're they're connected in in some way. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I guess I could say interested, but curious. And part of my exploration into myself and comedy is finding a way for other people to see things the way I see it. I guess that's what stand-up is. You want people to understand your point of view. You're literally ch telling them your, how you see the world. But why yeah. is it that people – here's what it is. <laughs> people need their game to be handed to them on a platter. Mm -hmm. Yes. Here's, it's like going to a restaurant and, and me explaining to you – this is what you're eating. This is how the chef... And, and that, that makes sense. Yeah. And some people might always prefer that. And some people are very, very good at that. Yeah. But there is also something to, <clears throat> hey, this restaurant is amazing. Part of the experience is you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. Just know that he's not going to hurt you. Like, right. you know, we're meeting all the allergy requirements. There's yeah. no penis. There's no dairy. This is a gluten-free vegan restaurant. Mm -hmm. and he, uh, it's great. Trust it. And just... You're not just coming to taste some food that people are giving you. You're not just having dinner. You're having an experience. experience yeah. To me, I could have dinner at home. Yeah. I could watch The Office. It's going to be better than this person's stand-up. <laughs> yeah, right, I'm not right. going to hear somebody tell me a joke. Right. I'm going for an experience. Right. And pe when people are going and getting an experience, but they've either never experienced that or somebody said, hey, let's go out to Chili's. Yeah. Then they're automatically like, no, uh, it's not for me. But just hold on a second. Yeah. I worked so hard at this. Yeah. And I'm telling you, <laughs> there's no dairy in it. Yeah. It's relax. I'm yeah. on stage. The, spo the, sh the showing them what the game is going to be before the game happens is in stand up. It's in TV. It's in movies. It's why. Like when we try to, when Alice and I try to sell a movie, act one is the hardest act to write, even though it's the shortest. Like you got to set up characters, story, point of view, tone, voice, jokes, what the journey is about to be. That's like, not that's the, the, why the pilots are always. That's why so much the longer. first act of Little Miss Sunshine is one of the best first acts I've ever seen. You're at that dinner table. Every character's got their point of view. Ba 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 ba. I don't like you. He doesn't like him. He's a suicidal. He's not talking. She's trying to keep the family together. Little girl's got a chance. We're all going in the bus. Kind of like and how you explained, like, which I yeah. love the way you saw it. Home Alone. The whole thing is almost two acts, where it's the whole movie is just this setup, just yeah. for. And that last scene doesn't work if you don't understand everything about it. Yeah. And Home Alone, usually at minute 15 or 20, you get into the second act of a movie. And that's like the fun of the movie's premise. And Home Alone, that's like at an hour 10. The third act, out of nowhere, pivots into Three Stooges, slapstick, physical, pain comedy. That's not set up. That's not in anywhere in the beginning or the first two acts. And all of a sudden, we're just lighting these guys' hair on fire. Because we're, we're in the world. We understand <laughs> yeah, it. And it's just it just works. It's but what are you so saying good. about the, the games on a platter? I'm saying, so like when I was doing stand-up uh, all the time, there would be nights where a joke would be like, it would go whatever. But then other nights, if I hit the setup better, the same joke would be an A+. 
and it's it's not it's not a better joke. I just I didn't set it up correctly right. that other night. Now the setups. I, I look at this as an analogy where the punchline is the joke, but the setup is what you need. The way yes. I'll say it is. Um, answers are relatively easy. Finding the questions to ask are what's difficult. Yeah. It's like, how, what, what's this? I don't know this. But you know that you don't know that. There are a million ways to find it. You, you have the foundation. That's why setups are so important. Yeah. Uh, in this, this comedy math conversation we're having, sometimes the setup means, here's what I'm about to Liter give you. Literally, yeah. And th but sometimes the setup is, you know, if, I, if, if there's a horror movie <laughs> and we were to say to you, somebody's about to jump out of the cupboard, you don't get the proper experience. Right. But at the same time, if some, some people might just not want to have a heart attack, but let, me, let me, hold on, let me finish this one example. But there are ways of telling people what it is that you're letting people in yeah. on what you're doing without telling them. In a, in a horror movie, it's the music or the lack of music or the silence, the suspense, you're building it yeah. and then it comes. But you cannot in that game tell people, somebody's about to do this, somebody's about to do this. Right. And... I, I think that telling people what you're about to do and having a literal setup is important and good and can be right, but there, it's not wrong to, to not more sophisticated to do it with music yeah. or to awkwardness or to timing or, or to lack of timing. You know, you're going to a horror movie, so people are already expecting to be scared, and it, it works. I've noticed that when uh, uh, when I've done I've done almost all the shows I've done, people have been there and I've been on the show. There have been a few times, most of which was when we were on the dateable tour, and the people that came knew who I was, or a few times when 20 people came to see me, right? Mm -hmm. And when they know who I am, and that's what I'm excited about with this podcast of if touring ever happens again, Yeah, I'm at least given the benefit of the doubt of we're seeing this yeah. type of thing. And they know you, and you're going to crush. It's, it, I think it will help touring for sure. But literally, like, think about old-timey, like, Impre old timing they still do it today impression comics here's jeff goldblum eating a submarine breakfast. sandwich <laughs> oh sandwiches oh good oh good sandwiches i love it i love movies i love i love characters i love development i love i love an arc i was in a movie with uh meryl streep maybe probably if you had a guess she's in a lot of movies <laughs> subway yes yes dude i remember that <laughs> so funny but literally comics will, will tell you what you're about to see this is jim carrey brushing his teeth jim carrey yeah brushing his teeth uh -huh. whoa my god <laughs> you know but it's like imagine if you just did it without telling them what it's about gonna be you know <laughs> um yeah some things need it yeah and i would say that how, how do we deconstruct that point that you're making and turn that into a comedy game i would say because we know that impressionists set up their thing and they set it up again briefly after <laughs> yeah. and there's an archetype to it. I'm going to, instead of being an impressionist, and this isn't, I mean, this is still not that layered and deep, but just a simple version. Instead of being an impressionist, yeah. I'm playing an impressionist. Now to play an impressionist, I, you could, you could do an impression of somebody playing an impressionist, which would go like this. All right, I'm, this is what impressionists kind of do. All right, this is going to be Jim Carrey. Um, he just woke up. It's a little late, and he realizes he's got to get going because he's got to go to work, so he's brushing his teeth. So, again, Jim Carrey's in a rush, brushing his teeth. Jim Carrey, brushing his teeth. Jim Carrey, right, 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 right. Smoking, right? And then that's funny because here's somebody. You, you told me what was going to happen, yeah, and he's then making you did fun it. Of it. Yeah. Now, here's the experiential, experiential version of that. <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rick Glassman. You ever notice... You know, like you watch people, uh, my girlfriend, she brushes her teeth. Everybody has their own way of brushing their teeth, right? I was watching The Master the day and I was picturing, this is probably how Jim Carrey brushes his teeth. So this is Jim Carrey brushing his teeth. Jim Carrey brushing his teeth. All right, this is just Jim Carrey brushing his teeth. Smoking. So now people are like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, like what the fuck is going on? Some people might be like, oh, he's making fun of impressionists. Yeah. Some people might be like oddly and this happens when people sometimes people laugh at me and i get i don't know about mad but it's like no charisma no, baby you're laughing at the wrong thing no but yeah. they think that that impression of jim carrey is funny yeah and it's like no they think you're being earnest yeah but it still works so sure and then there are people like fuck that bad impression or hacky or whatever yeah, you blah, suck. Blah. <laughs> and and it's, it could be uncomfortable uh -huh. and at, at a certain point i actually i think i even have a clip of this i did 
impressions. Remember that outdoor show when I was doing Arnold Schwarzenegger and Christopher Walken? Yeah. And all these like obvious yeah. To me, the game is a guy who's unaware of the fact that, that this, this is, is something that everybody, yeah, it's over. Uh, yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger, man, these kids are, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's a funny guy. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, no. Come on. It goes like this, he goes, ah, get down, what are you doing? Yeah, get yeah, Arnold, suck my dick. <laughs> <laughs> Once people are in on that, they then they enjoy. get to enjoy, oh, he is deconstructing yeah. this thing while still doing the thing, while making jokes about the thing. I can't, but I can't <laughs> say I'm going to pretend I'm an impressionist because yeah. then it's, you know, it's a magician showing you You the, have to the find trick. more nuanced and sophisticated ways, but they still need to know. But yes, you're absolutely right. And you have, and that's why you've been doing so well before COVID. But they need to know on their own time that I try and control. Yeah. You know, by the second time I do it. Yeah. But without that first, like... Eh? There, yeah, anyway. Yeah. So, again, I want to apologize to too much of this, but yeah. this is stand-up, and I've talked about we'll stand-up a few it. times on this. Yeah. I don't think I'll be trimming it. I like right. everything I'm saying. It's just, it's a bit <laughs> self-indulgent, but also... This is my podcast, and I've, I don't know if I've ever had this long and in, in-depth in of a conversation with someone, and I love that I could do it with my best friend who knows my comedy, who is an amazing comedian and does his, has his own skill sets. And you've <laughs> No, seriously, you've offered me – I mean, I said it with the mermaid thing, but you've offered me perspective on my comedy, but I would say more than that on comedy in general, which has allowed me to grow, feeling a little emotional. Um, it's like at your at your wedding speech. Um, your understanding of structure has either taught me, or I think even more powerfully, I like I have understandings of things mm -hmm. that I it's it's subconscious. I've developed it, and it's great, and it goes. But it's just you have. Um, articulated it to way to me that either wasn't as efficient or I never even oh which has helped me either tap further into it yeah. avoid it control it yeah um and sometimes it's very easy like my favorite episode of friends is the one where they're all late and that's the one that's a bottle episode it contains it takes place in 20 minutes in real time where Ross is trying to get to his gallery event and Rachel isn't ready and Chandler and Joey are fighting over the chair and so all you need to know is that my things in 20 minutes, we have to go is Ross's point of view. And that fuels all the A story, the B story and the C story. Get dressed, get, get, get it. Get it. The, the, but if you don't know that Ross is in a hurry, literally the, the whole show doesn't exist. There's nothing. Um, yeah. yeah. So you, you have to, the, the, the bottom line is you have to let people in on it. Yeah. But it doesn't mean you have to explain it to them. Right. Um, and I'm, I thought I was ending it, but I'm going more. But Man, I, yeah. What's, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. I loved it. I just, I just, for some reason, I know it's over. I just wanted, for some reason, I wanted to talk about what a good mom Allison is. I don't know why I had that instinct. <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's do it. I also wonder why so many more writers are married with kids than, than actors. And I don't understand that divide either. Uh, right, writers, relatively speaking, have... Uh, more stable. Uh, it's, it's consistent both in the relatively nine to five situation. Also... Um, uh, a show that has uh, six actors has 10 writers. It's almost double the amount out there. Also, uh -huh. writers um, could sell scripts that never get made. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, at the peak, writers get paid more than actors. Like, if you look at the, the highest things, these big time creators, uh -huh. but generally speaking, actors make more, actors yeah. make more uh -huh. but it's harder to get an acting job. Yeah. And, um, do you think there's something to the actor is the product and they have to focus they have to focus on themselves more than a writer who's maybe more not us but generally speaking a writer could be more open to having a n normal relationship I think it's less about what the job entails and more about what the person why the person is attracted to that job Yes personality types that go a certain way Yeah writers relatively speaking would be more introverted than actors um, a lot of actors are look at me. A lot of writers are, I don't want to be on camera. And I think that's maybe why I thought about Allison is, is when I met her, she was always super funny, extroverted. She was at Second City. She was crushing, but she was also really good with her family. I could tell she was going to be a good mom. And I don't, this is, again, just because I know my time we'll is We'll cut up. to a clip of her performing. <laughs> hey, what's up, man? Hey, 
what's the difference between a Nora Pant and an Everyday Chino? Hmm, I don't actually know. You have to try both of one. Okay. Ooh, I wouldn't drink that because it's so expired. You just watched me pour it. Yeah, but I figured if you would pour it first, then I'd be able to... Live from New York, it's Saturday night! See? Uh, and... But then to like see her like you were talking earlier on her wedding day, to, I, I'm just like seeing her evolve. That was her wedding day and she was the most beautiful thing ever. And we started crying just instinctually on sight. And then seeing her become a writer. And there was this great moment in her first day of Undateable where there was a Shelly joke for Ron and Bill had everybody go around the table to pitch their what joke goes here for, for Ron. And Bunches. executive producers were pitching, supervising producers were pitching, all these guys were pitching. Allison's first day of work pitches this joke. And the, I remember the joke. The joke was, um, it's about Taylor Swift. I can feel her white girl, whatever. I can feel her white girl pain. It's like regular pain, only not serious. And it got this huge laugh and she beat everybody day one. And I was just like, I just remember being so impressed by her. And then at the time, I feel like I was a better writer. And she, but now she's for sure a better writer than me. And it's like weird for my ego, but also like I'm, I'm embracing it to see her crush now and to have seen her blossom. And now to see her be this mom, who's this, the most amazing mom you've ever seen. You've seen her with Iris. It's unbelievable, but she can still crush the scripts. And if we have a pitch for our cartoon, she can still crush that. And I don't, I just felt like maybe it's because it literally this in the whole pandemic, this is the first time I've been away from them for for two or three hours, which is crazy. And I, maybe I miss them subconsciously, but like just thinking about her arc, you're talking about like Michael Scott's arc and all these characters, people just thinking about Allison the last 10 years is just like, oof, sorry. I don't know where that came from. Well, Allison, <laughs> this one's for you. She's uh, still going, but uh, <laughs> we love her. And uh, yes. Allison, this, these buds are for you. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. To Allison. To Allison. To women. To, women. to girls. To people. With big at butts. And to white trash. My name's Rick Glassman. This is my, my special guest, third appearance, John DeWalt. And let's get into it. John, how are you? Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. I know I'm not as successful as your normal guests, but it's, it's an interesting moment to see our friendship and to learn about the middle class of the entertainment industry. Scoop, 